to the <coughs> British Airways Bear Hug. This venue is uh, sponsored by the very generous British Airways. And um, before we actually get into the proceedings for the entire festival and kickstart this wonderful venue today, I'm going to torture all of you for a few minutes and take you through a couple of mandatory announcements as well as uh, thank our sponsors. So I'll begin by thanking our sponsors. Uh, first and foremost, the title sponsors, which is Z Entertainment and Rajni Gandha. Following that, we have Incredible India, Google, who's always assisting us in finding what we need. British Airways, helping us get to places across the world. We have the Mahindra Humanity Center. We have Ford. We have Amazon.in, who is our book partner. So uh, soon enough, they should be drone dropping books into your homes. We have Coca-Cola, who's happily going to keep us all smiling through the festival with beverages. We have Public Diplomacy, keeping us all peaceful. We have Rajasthan Tourism, the beautiful sights and sounds of Rajasthan, for those of you who haven't visited or vis are visiting again. Um, our university partner, Amity University. UN Women, the Glen Livet, keeping us slightly happier than Coca-Cola. Um, MTS. Then we have our media partners, ladies and gentlemen, the Patrika Group, Hindustan Times, DNA, Danik Bhaskar, and Radio Mitri 98.3 FM. They will be bringing the Zep Jaipur Literature Festival to the outside world, so thank you for that. Ambit, uh, Arts and Culture, that's the government of Meghalaya, the Aga Khan Foundation, the Jan Mikalski Foundation, uh, the Indian Quartet, Penguin Random House, YPOWPO, our venue partner, of course, the wonderful Diggy Palace, uh, we thank them for once again hosting this absolutely brilliant festival. Our hospitality partner, the Rambagh Palace for the inaugural dinner. Then uh, the Le Meridian for the Writer's Ball. And of course, the daily music stage every evening at the Clarks Armair. <coughs> Our healthcare partners, for those of you who might be in need of any kind of healthcare at any time, is Fortis. Our ticketing partner is Kya Zunga. Our decor partner, Royal Treasure. Kingfisher, keeping us happy with Glenn Livet. Hospitality Partners, ITC Hotels, and the Oberoi Raj Villa. Those are our sponsors. A big thank you to all of them for making this festival a possibility and actually making it happen. Thank you all, the audience, the wonderful audience that makes this festival the great festival that it is. Thank you for those of you coming for the first time. Welcome. For those of you returning, thank you for coming back. All right, now the additional announcements before we get into the first session for the day. Uh, please do not leave your bags unattended at the festival. Um, not only will the festival not be able to take responsibility for the loss, it might create panic and confusion. Please ensure that your phones are placed on silent throughout every session. And if you really, really, really need to take the call, please exit through the aisle and take it outside. No flash photography is permitted inside the venue at any time, so please refrain from flash photography. The festival requests you keep uh, helping keeping the venue clean, so anything you bring in with you, and preferably no eatables or, or drink, uh, drink, drinks. I mean, I don't think you would really bring in drinks, but you get the point. Try not to eat in the venue. Keep it clean. Uh, <clears throat> keep the aisles free. This is the British Airways bed hug, so we don't have, uh, you know, I would love that if we had those exit signs marked and our emergency exits and sliders for floods, but we have none of that. But go out through the venue, uh, through the aisle, keep it clean. Please do not sit in the aisle. That's actually the main appeal over here. Uh, the venues get filled really fast and there's utter chaos and confusion when the aisles are full. There are no other entrances except the main entrance. So we would again request you to please not fill up the aisles. Um, it says please remain calm. So keep calm and enjoy the show. And uh, I'm just going to quickly run through that in Hindi. Also, smoking is strictly prohibited in all areas on the venue, except for the designated smoking area. So if you want to smoke, please find your way there. Uh, right. <coughs> so I'm just going to cover that once more in Hindi. Uh, वो भरने की कोशिश ना करें लावारिस वस्तु अगर कोई लावारिस वस्तु आपको पड़ी हुई दिख जाए तो कृपया उसको उठाके सिक्योरिटी में जमा कर दीजिए और किसी आपातकालीन स्थिति में आप शांत रहिए और आयल से बाहर निकलिए और शांति बनाए रखें सो लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन विद दैट आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू बोर यू फर्दर यू कैन फाइंड द लाइफ जैकेट्स अंडर योर वेस्ट्स बिकॉज़ वी आर गोइंग टू एंटर द फर्स्ट 
session for the day and for the Baithak for this year. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I bring to you the quantity theory of insanity, which is Will Self in conversation with Jeet Thayil. Thank you both for being here and have a wonderful session, ladies and gentlemen. marvelous anecdote that the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer tells, and he says uh, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, is like a man who goes to a masked ball, and all evening he dances with a beautiful woman who is wearing a mask, and at midnight all the masks come off, and it is revealed to him that he has been dancing with his wife. <laughs> That's what my life's been like. <laughs> Um, can we do something about the monitors? They're kind of bouncing back at us. I can barely hear what we're saying. Is I that like that. Can yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like to speak into a vacuum. <laughs> Actually muddy it up while you're at it. Um, we're going to, it's a real pleasure to be here speaking with Will Self. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, a reading from Umbrella, his book of short listed novel. Um, shall we start with that? Yeah. this sort of um, umbilicus dangling off me. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> there we go. I've only just been born, and the cord is yet to be cut. So this novel, Umbrella, I'm not going to tell you much. I'm just going to throw you into this scene. Uh, it's the protagonist is a, a young, working-class woman. She's, well, she's a girl, really, at this point. She's about 14, 15 years old. She's called Audrey Death. OK? That sounds kind of weird, people called Death. But actually, in the eastern part of England, East Anglia, Death is quite a common name. There are two big concentrations of Deaths around the towns of Colchester and Ipswich. And the reason I called my protagonist Death is Death is an English name that is a common noun that has a great deal of resonance, and it's short, not unlike self. So, you see it. And Audrey's family in the novel are in fact based on my own family. So she's called Audrey Death, and her father is a man called uh, Samuel Death, and uh, his nickname is Rothschild Death, Rothschild Death, because he's a very grandiloquent figure. He smokes a big cigar, he wears a hat. Uh, it's all a bit strange, because his actual job is to work on the trams as a conductor. Uh, and in this scene, Samuel Death, Rothschild Death, is taking his 14-year-old daughter, Audrey, up to the West End of London from where they live in the western inner suburb of Fulham. It's a Saturday afternoon. This is a very unusual thing for him to do. Uh, he has an errand. That's all you need to know, except that it is 1902. Umbrella. Getting down at Charing Cross, still sucking her pear drop, Audrey turns from the sooty black drain pipe of Nelson's column to be put upon by Bosporine, the remedy of kings, and players, navy cut, momentarily sandwiched between two sandwich men and one spreed engulfed by the hubbub of the afternoon crowds. Clerks and shop walkers, released for their half day, dodge and jig across the road. One snappy chappy pops under the very shafts of a growler. The cabby flicks his whip, but the three ladies behind, chandeliers wrapped in muslin, disdain to notice. Bloody oath! 
Her father's oak rises above the Charivari as he upbraids a ragamuffin, the worse for drink, who cavorts about an organ grinder. A few paces on, Audrey looks back at this man's pillbox hat, his torn and filthy scarlet tunic. He's an old soldier who hops on an ash plant, the empty leg of his trousers flapping. But Sam Death won't be caught napping. He weaves through the throng along the strand, then wheels Audrey round to join a queue who are taking their turn to peer in the eyepiece of a kinetoscope plunked down beside the foyer doors of the old Tivoli. Her head ducked into this comedia, she sees a pretty columbine pirouette around a capering ape. My eyes scape, her gyration not smooth, but jerking forward then back, the double exposure of the film depicting a meeting with her transparent double. The title card slots in. Miss Lottie Farquhar, appearing nightly in Darker Delights. Stalled seats for a limited period. Five and sixpence, fully electrified. His four on her again. Perhaps it'd be agreeable to you if we were to take the back way. Audrey wonders, what errand can it be that her father runs for Arnold Collins, his inferior, one he has always treated with amused contempt? The tip of his umbrella fingers the joins between the cobbles as they cross the corner of Covent Garden, ignoring the leather apron porters lounging against the empty crate ignoring the rotten fruit underfoot and the Arabs scrabbling for it. The dust is massing in the corners of the square, lying in wait. Little Dublin, he remarks casually as they cross Drury Lane. Every third storefront is boarded up with heavy planks, some scrawled with prim sigils, although why? There's nothing here to have away. The narrow entries to the godforsaken courts are blocked off with timber bulwarks, and through a gap in one, Audrey sees the lime-washed ghost of a dwelling, some of the condemned tenants standing in front of it, their faces and clothing creased with dirt. They are, she understands, too weak with anger, be dangerous. One boy, her own age, who lolls in a doorway, wears no trousers, no pockets, no pockets to pick. His man-sized shirt torn up past his hip. An, <coughs> an idiot grin slitting his potato head. The final shard of the boiled sweet snaps between Audrey's they simper, the three little maids, women of the unfortunate class. Death chews this phrase over before spitting it out more coarsely. Women of the unfortunate class. They'll sell their cells for thruppence, tuppence, or a loaf of stale bread. One makes as if adjusting something in her bodice, a corsage that's in visibubble. Audrey feels her bubbies prickle and the sweat damp shift still wadded between her thighs. I don't need no snow block bands. I need the WC. There are no words to say this. A year or so ago, yes, but not now. Beyond the pub hatch where the whores have gathered, the street ends in another timber bulwark this one two stories high and plastered with the pink cheeks, golden curls, and frothing white suds of Hudson soap. To the right of the hoarding, a cranny leads into a long, narrow lane 
the carriageway barely wide enough for a cart, the shop fronts to either side antiquated, their many paned and thick mullioned windows plastered with Adson's dirt, as are their horizontal shutters, some of which have been let down to form the basis of stalls. Up above are more wooden bafflers, tilting out at reaches from the building. Ordinary great step. Those, Deck is amused by what pricked her curiosity. Those are mirrors, Audrey, to catch a slice of the heavens and chuck it in the window. Of course, anyone peeking down from on top could see a body stepping into her smalls. Who is he? My father. As they go on, the hush she had not been aware of deepens. The never-ending snarl of the city street tails away into a single bark tossed from jaws to jaws. A solo motor horn yelps at you. The alleyway scores deeper into the damp clay. Halting, her father takes a small leather-bound volume from the stack of books on the floor. And as he lifts it to his face, the cover falls open to expose marbled end papers, then drops off altogether, along with several leaves which scrape their way to the ground. At once, a white head pops up from behind the tree. The Meg Muller! It turns out to be a mountain man with turban wound out to meet his tall. And when he pulled up his plaid cane, little friend. He grabs Audrey's shoulder and twists her upright, pulling it with him to cut her. Tell me, he says in a low voice, ain't Mr. Beauregard still trading yet? The mountain man runs his disgusting eye over the pages of the book from top to cut before answering disdainfully, <laughs> Beauregard won't Ball dropped on that cuck in Garrett. Not that he ain't made his brains for it. He's stuck premises with some chonk <laughs> on the Mile End Road. Deck lifts the digital carapace of his bowler and runs a hand over his damp face. In that case, he says, I will assess. He has some uh, merchandise for Brother Colin. statement of fact, a 
companies by the refusal of a waxed paper is done so with the savage poking of a pinch's sharpened spur. You, Jason, maybe he hooked his umbrella over his left arm and groped deeply inside the pocket. Audrey said, run out. find a coffee shop along the way. Sit tight with the tucker and his pipe. I'll come after you in a bit. The mountain man fumed and followed her down the road. Hip, 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 hip. Let's go. She turned back once with a laugh in her ears. A tent stood some three feet from the window of the van. Its other light sign beside it contained 10 ounce chop, 6 piece, cutlet, 5 piece, fried onion, and 10 piece. That's me. A man comes from within to stand in the doorway, wound tightly into his apron into the same shape as the milk churn he sets down. He has thick black curly side whiskers, and below his red Jaeger Joker rests on his black umbrella. A barefoot hiker boy comes limping along the lane, his cap pulled right down, the sleeves of his man's jacket rolled right up. His arms are all bright and iron. In one hand he holds a tin dragon fly with wheels. And stopping by the coffee shop man, he raises his bloody We both gone. It's a while before Audrey realizes it's addressed to her and then to the tent. Another night of terror. Still she sleeps. Too little to tell the truth. Had it been coated with the brown and black of the tobacco pipe, bleach, and then ground oil. The gas light in the center had been fused in one another. The man asks Audrey what she wishes for, and while he's absent in the back, the diffuser heats up and begins to spew some droplets condensed on the ceiling, then fall, one hissing on the gas mixture, a flame inside. She opens her hand. The thruppence has impressed the poor tucker with the most amazing things. The man comes back with a mug of tea, and two slices of bread and marge, sliced diagonally. I don't know why I does that, he says, looking at the droplets swell and fall. But I always does. He turns the key in the pipe, and the fuser pops on. Could I? Is there? There can be no mistaking. Surely the reason for her discomfort. He points off hand at him and says, Jake is out back. He goes and finds a lean-to against the kitchen wall. Beyond it, another section of the two-story high timber brick wall. And beyond this, the wreckage wall hangs from the foggy dark. That's the real thing. When she returns, she's lit the geezer again. And as she nibbles the slices and sips the tea, she stands erect by the matchboard counter, head up, massaging the goiter, while doggily listening to its rising note. There's no arm in this. Orders left a shrug, cool, red. Still, her father does not come. Abruptly, Audrey rises from the stew. The man gives her a penny into his farthing exchange, which she holds so tightly as she walks back up the road with the metal disc replaced by nothing. A Negro elf, the man of steel. There's no one about except a tall gent in a chopper who reminds her of an illustration she'd seen of Brown.
Graham Gilliam, the personator, those hot hands that you both have, fellows whose job was shut, tapping fearfully on the door to be relieved when it swings open so Surrey's ends can smell of mouse droppings ammoniacal residue of birds. Inside, there is no illumination at all, only different strengths of darkness, a black bat night rushing against you. You mount the stairs to the accompaniment of a concerto of flutes, one flight, a second, a third, then boost along a landing at eye level to where bright white light and a piggish grunt. Her belly heaves. You slow your ascent. Last month, Mary Jane kicked thee up with cotton pads and an itchy belt sewn from hanging post. When Audrey pointed out to her the advertisement on the back of a free library book, sanitary, absorbent, antiseptic, available from all traces, her mother snapped, what you think we are, but not unkindly. A cord that stretches forth from her tummy button along the landing and under the door draws her in with each <coughs> every piggish grunt. She barges the door with her shoulder and collapses into a room lit brilliantly by clear bulbs under shades of frosted glass. In front of a floor-length nankeen drape, an aspidistra in a hammered bronze pot. Beside this, a chaise long covered in green velvet. On this, the skinned rabbit, what the piker had, with glistening dead legs sticking up from a mess of petticoats. Standing with his back to Audrey, a bare-assed man dug something into the rabbit's belly. Gain it? No, no, no! That won't do at all! A florid man with pomaded hair in his shirt sleeves and a fancy embroidered waistcoat comes out from behind a kinematographic apparatus set up in the paper in the corner of the attic. No, 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 he cries again. His expression is mad and guileless. This is early morning. Mr. Beauregard, Audrey ventures, but the red-faced man ignores her. His regard is fixed. When Audrey turns back, there's no Tony, only a girl a little older than her who sits on the chaise, buttoning her fabby into her bodice. The girl's hair is up, apart from a few stray locks, and atop its nondescript mass sits a lady's top, complete with magenta-dyed ostrich feathers. There's no bare-arsed man either, only Audrey's father, who's standing there in his long rabbit skin coat and buttoning up gloves I've never seen before. He doesn't acknowledge his daughter, but raises his bowler to Mr. Beauregard, says, Au revoir, my dear, to the girl, and retrieving his umbrella and a brown paper parcel from behind the drape, conducts Audrey unceremoniously. book that gives this session its title, Quantity Theory of Enchantment, a book of short stories that was published in 1991. It appeared in India in 1992 because at that time books didn't travel so fast through the country. And I, I remember reviewing it for a magazine called Gentleman in Bombay. Uh, I had a, a, a task getting it past the editor, uh, but I did. And uh, the title of the story suggests that there's a limited amount of sanity in the world. That if you cure an asylum of crazies in London, a group of perfectly sane people 
would go crazy in New York. Then there's a story called the London Book of the Dead that suggests that the afterlife is a suburb where the dead have dead boring jobs. Tell us something about the circumstances in which you wrote this book. Wow, that's a question. You're asking me to go back like 25 years, decades. Okay, uh, I was just married. I was uh, 27 years old. commercial publishing company, like a business publishing company, and my wife was pregnant uh, with our first child, and I thought, if I don't, I'd always wanted to write, I wanted to write since my teens, I thought if I don't do it now, uh, I'm going to be already genetically superseded before I've even written a book, and, and that was one of the things that really made me sit down. I would get up very early in the morning, about 5.30 a.m., drive into the city where I work, and before the other people came in at 9 o'clock, I would write in the morning. And that's how I wrote The Crossing Series of Sciences. Is it true that you were paid 1,700 pounds as an advance? Yeah, 1,700 pounds as an advance. At, at the time, that was real that's, money. Well, uh, pro rata, I would have done better work in But it was okay. Uh, and the book, you know, it, it won a Literary Prize. It was, it, it was then published around the world. So I probably made more money out of it eventually. But we're not here to talk about money. Of course we are. Um, the psychiatrist or anti-psychiatrist, Zach Eastman, Bergman, please, makes an appearance in that type of story. Uh, he's also appeared in two other story collections as well as the novels The Great Ape, The Book of Days, and most recently, Umbrella. Yes, he's also in my, my um, fictional memoir, Walk into Hollywood, which is also oh, written out. Yeah. Uh, what do you and Zach have in common, other than a liking for Jimi Hendrix? Okay, well, Zach Kushner is a, is a sort of friend and disciple of, uh, I mean, not really, because he's a fictional character, but in, in my world, of a famous uh, uh, Scottish psychiatrist and thinker about psycho psychoanalytic theory and philosophy called Roddy Lang, R.D. Lang. And R.D. Lang was in a way the kind of Spinoza, the kind of focus for this thing called the anti-psychiatric movement of the 1960s. And really Lang did some amazing work. He was one of the first people. At that time, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, there were over 125,000 people with long-term mental institutions in Britain. And Lang was one of the people who was working as a, as a psychiatrist in one of these big asylums who saw how, basically how badly mentally ill people were treated. They were sort of dumped into these places. And he started pioneering a much more human and emotional and direct interpersonal uh, thing. But at that time, it then grew into this big attack institutional psychiatry, and even in Lang's view, to the argument that schizophrenia shouldn't be viewed or psychoses shouldn't be viewed as illnesses at all. Uh, they should be viewed as different ways, equally valid, of viewing the world with their own kind of language. So my character, Pushner, I, I myself was very influenced by R.D. Lang. I, I read his works in my late teens, early 20s. He had a big influence on me, along with thinkers like Michel Foucault uh, and Thomas Zarg. And Pushner is kind of like me in that respect, but more so. He's very influenced by, but he works as a hospital psychiatrist himself. And he's old, is he? He's about um, 30 years older than me. Uh, yeah, about 25 to 30 years older than me. He's a, his parents died in the blip, uh, something we learn in Umbrella. Uh, they, he's from a German-Jewish background, but they've been living in England for a while. Uh, he's married many times. He has many children. He's very sexual as a person. Uh, I mean, you know, he is. Why else would he be here? Um, I mean, I don't mean here. I mean here <laughs> on, on the planet. Uh, I don't know. You, you, you've got to read the books, guys, and then meet him in all his glory. Um, what, what's the, uh, I think it's true to say that you have an obsession with 
insanity or insanity. What, what is that? What, what's that all about? Um, I think it's partly personal. It's partly political. Uh, I started having, you know, what people might call mental health problems in my late teens. Uh, by the time I was in my early 20s, I was kind of going around as a therapist and I was an outpatient in a psychiatric ward where I got a lot of my material for the early book. Uh, and it was political at the same time. And the fundamental thought for me is, you know, when we're very unhappy about the world and we're very disturbed by what's going on, we're disturbed by our personal relationships, we find something very unsettling about our lives and about our consciousness. Is that not in some sense a real apprehension about what the world's like? And in a way, I suppose, and that's bound up in the quantity theory of insanity, which on the surface of it looks like a preposterous idea. How can it be that this fixed amount of sanity could go round? But in a way, I still think the quantity theory of insanity is true. I think our societies, our cultures, organize themselves around really quite a culturally relativistic idea of what sanity is. And everything else, eccentricity, uh, you know, in some cultures, religious heresy, in some other cultures, political dissent, is branded as being crazy. Uh, you know, so I think that that kind of division, and particularly in Britain where I live, the, in, in the past, you would either be good or bad, but now you're either mad or sane. And the kind of interchangeability of those categories is what gives a lot of the impetus to my investigation of mental illness. For me, it's a political issue in that way. Can you talk about what you did? I, I know you, you read philosophy in university, not English. Um, just talk about your first job after you left university. Oh, wow. I, I, my first job quite sure what my first job was. I mean, I worked, I worked for the old Greater London Council running a kind of speech project for a while. And then I had a kind of Nevin obsession, like a lot of young middle class men, I think, in particular. You know, the character of Levin in uh, Anna Karenina. Anna Karenina yeah. You know, and he goes off to live on his estate in the country and he wants to be at one with the peasants. And I was, you know, like all young, all good young people, I was a socialist. Uh, and I thought it was important for me to, to work in a way that, you know, expressed solidarity with working people. So I worked as a, a laborer uh, for a builder for about six or eight months. Uh, very difficult laboring, quite tough. Uh, and I was eventually beginning to get the hang of it. Uh, and uh, I gave up the job. My boss was very surprised. And I had a terrible moment of snobbery. He said, uh, I said, I'm leaving, I'm, I'm leaving the company. He said, uh, why? Why? And I said, I think I can probably do a little better for myself with a philosophy degree from Oxford. Uh, he said, well, you're an idiot, because I was about to give you a ride. <laughs> and then you got a job as a cartoonist. With yes. The newspaper. I'd always, I'd drawn cartoons at, at university for uh, a variety of publications, satirical cartoons. And when I left the university, I, I just, in those days, everything was physical. Everything was analog. Everything was on paper. I had a little portfolio of my cartoons, little portfolio of cartoons, and I just physically walked along Flea Street, going into newspaper offices and saying, please, kind newspaper man, publish my little satirical cartoons. And amazingly, I picked up work that way and, and uh, could almost support myself, I think. With the new statesman? with the new statesman, who I, I still work for 30, 30 years later, 35 years later, but most I write for them. Didn't they at one point fire you for being too depressing? They did. They did, yeah. I had a strip with them, a cartoon strip called Slump. This is the, during the early 80s after Margaret Thatcher had come to power in England, and, and her policies, or her government's policies, had led to kind of mass unemployment and beating the people who were out of work. Uh, nobody could get a job. So my character was called Slump, and his response to the economic slump was to go to bed and just stay in bed. He was like, uh, you know, uh, the Russian novelist Oblomov's character, uh, Goncharov's character, Oblomov. Uh, he was like this complete apathy, you know, just withdrew from the world. Uh, and yeah, after a while, I mean, it ran for two or three years, and then they said, no, it's too depressing. You have to go. 
um, in another early book, Cock and Bull, which appeared in uh, 93, uh, a woman grows a penis and rapes her husband in the cock what part of the story. What year? And in the bull part of the story, a man grows a vagina behind his penis. What year? Um, style, it, it sounds uh, like a crazy book, but stylistically, I think it might, may have been one of your more conventional novels. Um, because Cock is also partly the story of a woman's revenge against a drunken, dull husband. Yes. Uh, would you agree that it's also the work of a moralist? Yes, I think that's right. I mean, I think it's very much in the news at the moment, of course, what is the purpose and, and the role and the nature of satire, and why do we create satires. I, I, in as much as I have been a satirist in my career, and I don't think I wholly am a satirist, I do other stuff too, I think the purpose of satire is moral reform. There is no other point to satire, in my view. Satire without an agenda of moral reform is just being unpleasant. It's as simple as that. It's just being rude or offensive. If there isn't an underlying moral suggestion there, in, in Cock and Bull, in particular in the novella Cock, what I wanted to investigate was this idea that was very current in feminist thinking at that time, which was a kind of feminist essentialism. Uh, and the idea is something like this. If you have a penis, you will be a rapist, potentially. And I wanted to kind of investigate that idea and in some ways satirize it and in some ways satirize the inversion of that idea as well. Okay, if, I give you, if you're a woman and I give you a penis, will you become a rapist? Okay, if you're a man, quite a macho man, and I give you a vagina, will you become gentle? And, and you know, it was that kind of thing. Uh, so, for you, a, a, a novel starts with an idea rather than an image or a line or language. It starts with many things, but I think a lot of the earlier fiction, I was very interested in this idea of a single conceit, and you can see where it comes from. As a cartoonist, you're always concerned with the punchline, and you're always concerned with the relationship between the text and the visual. It's, it's like a, an ideogram, and, and it needs to be apprehensible very quickly. So yeah, the early books have that kind of almost cartoonish character. They derive from a single idea in that way. I, I'm not so, so sure the later books are quite as a kind of lyric. Gentle, yeah. yeah, more lyric. Um, you were also fired, speaking of firing, you were also fired by the Observer for substance abuse and a prime ministerial claim. You said at the time that you were fed up with the hypocrisy of the media which promoted you as a writer who couldn't write. Yeah, I had this kind of period, I guess, in my late 20s, early 30s, where I was quite well known in England. And I had a column at the Times for the Observer, the newspaper. And it was widely known that I had a drug problem. I mean, it was no secret. It was, an open, it was openly known. I, I even wrote about it quite publicly. And uh, they sent me to cover. It was the election of 96, John Major's uh, re-election campaign. Uh, and it wasn't some kind of Hunter Thompson stunt or something that I was trying to kind of attache the, the British establishment. I just happened to have a heroin habit. You know, it was just, that was the way it was. It, for me, it was, I mean, I'm being a little blasé, but it was like smoking a cigarette. It but was a maintenance issue. It was a maintenance issue. Uh, unsurprisingly, I had many enemies in the English press camp. Uh, and did they have a camera in the loop? No, they didn't have a camera. Uh, it, was, it was this one guy who saw me go. We, we took off from RAF North Holt, just north of London, to the Midlands. That's what, it, that's what it's like when you're a prime minister, okay? You fly 70 miles in a jet with the, all of the press. Why? Why would you do that? To visit a factory where they make earth moving equipment, JCBs. Uh, and give a little speech. That's an election campaign. Uh, and uh, this guy saw me when I came back. I went to the toilet after he was off. And uh, it was just this hunch. He didn't tell the police. I was never arrested. He told the then chairman of the Tory party, of the Conservative party. It was quite a contested election. There were three bar. And it became a political issue. Because it became, you know, because the Observer was associated with the Labour Party, and was trying to get elected under Blair, and I was seen as a left-wing figure, uh, the idea was that the Labour campaign was in some way corrupt and everything else. So it became a big political issue, and, and the editor of The Guardian called me in and 
that these accusations are going around. I want you to sign a legal affidavit saying that it's not true. Well, I, I have denied it with a couple of credentials. Wouldn't you? Uh, and as William Burroughs said, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Uh, and at that point, when I had to sign a legal affidavit, I realized I would do perjury on myself. I should be looking at five years jail sentence. And so better to be sacked than to be loose. Right, so I confessed to that. Um, in How the Dead Live, a uh, novel published in 2000, uh, it was the first book you wrote under the influence of no illegal substances. Oh, I didn't write any of the books under the influence of illegal substances. <laughs> no, not really. You can't write seriously when you're on drugs or high. You, know, you can even miss. So you write when you're sober. <laughs> you know about that, do right. you? <laughs> well. I don't know why you're like pretending that you well. don't. He's only written a book saturated in opiate. Well. I mean, his book is so full of opium that you can even smoke a bit of the book <laughs> and get high. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, he's sitting there like a sort of minister. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't do anything about that. Yeah. No, you don't write when you're high. I mean, if you do write when you're high, you'd better be damn certain you revise it when you're straight. Yeah. You know, writing is, is, is a task for which you need every scrap of lucidity that God gave you. No, I never wrote much journalism, to be sure. You can <laughs> no, 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 no. That is not to denigrate journalism. It's just to observe that they're intoxicated. Right. That's fine. No, I love journalism. I've worked in journalism for many, many years. But the fact of the matter is that journalism is a craft. You know, it, you, you know who your readership is. You know what you want to do for them and you can do it with a gun. But I'm sorry, call me old fashioned, for me fiction is an art, and art requires full attention. But you're right, I stopped taking, drinking alcohol and taking drugs at any time. Uh, 15 years, 15 years ago, yeah. I'm just gonna read, we have only 10 minutes left, I wanna open this up for questions. But I wanna read a little thing that um, the great British writer, Julie Burcho, uh, wrote in The Guardian about Will. She said, and I'm quoting, you've got to understand what Will Self represented sexually in the 90s. Despite his drug and alcohol intake, to us London media babes, he was a sexual icon packing the oomph of Jimi Hendrix, Robbie Williams, and Gordon Brown all rolled into one. Every man wanted to be him and every woman wanted to have him. They usually did too. My daughter's here too. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's grown up and everything, but there are some things she really perhaps shouldn't hear about with her father. Um, I don't know about that, Julie Burchill, mad bitch. <laughs> she used to stalk me. She used to sort of follow me around. No, and now she's she's uh, she's written this book called Unchosen about her great love for the Jewish people. Uh, and it's a racist book because it typifies the Jews as a racist outfit, which is ridiculous. She's, she's a classic example, Birchall. I love having to say, say unpleasant things about people back home. It's so nice. Um, she's a good example. I profiled her years ago. She's a good example of what, when a very, very brilliant woman spends her entire adult life willfully making herself stupider. And now she's reached a logical conclusion and become a moron. <laughs> um, <laughs> talk about quotable quotes. We've had about 50 in the space of half an hour. Um, let's open this up. Questions from the audience? Yes. Baudelaire said, like, you're more or less all insane, and I know uh, you said that you used to think that, but tell us something about uh, how your Poisson insanity affects your poem writing. I'm Did sorry, you I, I can't hear you uh, through the... Can you hear me now? Uh, no, I can hear you, but the, the, the enunciation seems okay. to be irregular. So, Baudelaire said, like, you're more or less all insane, uh, and I 
know board members have this view, uh, but what the relationship of insanity with the Freudian insanity attitude? Does it have any changes on their form? So were there changes in your form, and what were the changes on your form? Yeah, well, you're saying does insanity change over time? No, I, the form of your work. Oh, the form of my work. Uh, yeah, I think it's changed. It's changed. Certainly the prose style has changed a lot. Uh, the prose style now is more obviously crazy than it was to begin with when I, I think I wrote almost in a kind of classical style to begin with. Uh, is that kind of answering your question? I don't, I don't know whether I was right or wrong. Oh, it was for him. Oh, well, for you. No, it's a Will Self question. talking about poetry, well, you know, to even want to write poetry or to even want to be a poet, you have to be fairly insane. Uh, I, I don't think that anybody, any, any person in their right mind would choose a life of obscurity, no money, and very, very hard work. You have to be insane to even attempt it. Um, so insanity has its uses. Yeah, it's not really telling the truth. The thing about being a poet is sex. They're all sex mad. And they have sex the whole time, poets. Well, <laughs> well that's now all they get only to. one problem. They can only have sex mostly with each other. <laughs> and, and, and with certain notable exceptions, they're incredibly ugly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're I, a psychiatrist. Yeah. I read your book, Umbrella, just recently. It's a wonderful book. I read your book, Umbrella. Umbrella? Umbrella. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You read Umbrella? Yeah. And yeah. I found it wonderful. But how would a person working running psychiatry understand the book? How does a psychiatrist no, understand? How would a non-psychiatrist understand the book? How, how does a non-psychiatrist understand the book? Well, I don't know. He's read it and he's not a psychiatrist. Can you understand it? Uh, very much. Yes, yeah. I don't think um, psychiatry has, is a qualification to read that book. You just need to read it carefully. Yeah, I mean, I, th I certainly think, uh, uh, I mean, presumably you as a psychiatrist found a lot of it instantly understandable because it's your profession. But I think that there is, you know, most kind of well-educated people could get it at some level, right? Can, can I ask one question before we end? Um, the satanic worship is banned in um, India. And at the time, a poet, one of the great Indian poets, Nithin Avicio, liberal figure, um, supported the ban because he said, we live in a country where uh, people kill each other over this. In the context of Europe today and um, Charlie Hebdo, uh, what would you say about a certain kind of self-censorship in, in certain uh, cases or even the banning of a book if you know that it's going to lead to to death, obviously. Well, I think the big distinction between banning things and self-censorship, and actually we're all involved in self-censorship the whole time. We all understand once we reach adulthood that there are contexts within which it's inappropriate to say things. And furthermore, you have to consider, going back to the discussion of satire at the beginning, you have to say that the purpose of satire is moral reform. Well, if the purpose of satire is moral reform, how do you achieve moral reform? You don't actually achieve moral reform by offending people. It doesn't actually work. So you need to kind of ask what the purpose of this is. It seems to me that in the West and in other parts of the world, the idea of freedom of speech has become a shibboleth. It's become something you have to say in order to be viewed as a liberal person. And if you say anything against it, then you're necessarily a fascist or a reactionary of some kind. So you have to ask yourself, what is it that people do with their freedom of speech? Is it that they're involved in constructive arguments moving us towards a better society? Is it that they seek to establish dialogue with people who don't agree with them or are 
checking their ways? Is it that they try and find interfaith commonality in communication? Or is it that they simply want to say fuck and kiss and piss and look at pornography? Because I think that that's what freedom of speech has come to really mean for a lot of people, is it's the freedom of their own libidinal imagination. It's the freedom that they feel guilty about what's going on in their head. It's the freedom that they feel is expressed via an internet and a web that is full, frankly, of perversion and exploitation of one form or another. It's not actually a freedom in order to attack. You know, I very much believe in Mencken's definition of journalism can be applied to satire. Good satire should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Afflict the comfortable, comfort the afflicted. If I wanted to write a satirical blast against the Saudi Arabian government for their schizophrenic support on the one hand of a relationship with the West that is exploitative of people in the, the Middle East and, and is constituative of some of the kind of political problems that there are in the region, and at the same time covertly fund the Wahhabist and Salafist terrorists who are threatening the West at the moment, then that would be a valid satire. That would be a valid satire because the House of Saud is a powerful group of people and they need to be made to feel uncomfortable about what they're doing. But to produce cartoons of the, of the Prophet is not to offend the House of Saud, it's to offend every Muslim person. So what is the point of that? Because many, many Muslim people are poor and powerless. So they are not fit objects of satire. It's as simple as that. Êtes -vous, êtes -vous, êtes -vous Charlie Hebdo? Absolument non. Je n'ai pas Charlie. Uh, le journaliste uh, qui est uh, tué dans le bureau de Charlie Hebdo, il sont mieux. Il n'est pas mieux. <laughs> yes, déjà. Uh, no, I'm not I'm, Charlie Hebdo I'm because not I'm not Charlie dead. in that sense. I, I, I spoke out on this matter soon after the shootings, perhaps a little quickly, uh, but that's what I'm like. Uh, I think we need to rethink some of these ideas. The idea of freedom of speech, particularly in France, came in under an absolutist monarchy with a, with a, with a closed off press. That kind of humor that Charlie Hebdo uh, was putting out was like a fossil humor. It was like a fossil from the French revolutionary period. Bear in mind the great French Revolution that involved in the extrajudicial killing of perhaps 60,000 people in two months. It was an extremely bloody affair. You know, so I think we need to accept that things change. There are no rights without responsibilities. There are no rights without duly constructed governments and states. And also, get over it, guys. Things change. There is no law in human that is immutable and can never be changed. Everything changes. That's what can, it. What can you add to that? Thank you so much. Will Phelps.